Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we'll be discussing Arthur, released July 17th, 1981. It was written and directed by Steve Gordon and released by Warner Brothers. Something else happened uh, two days before this movie got released. Richard Wells was born. I was born. Wait, what? I have that on my chart. Well, Hold you didn't. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did I not put that in my notes? I'm going to assume that your mother was in the audience for Arthur on opening weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two days after giving birth. Here, take him. I'm going to the movies. <laughs> well, happy birthday, Richard. Thank you. Now you exist. Yeah. Now you'll remember every movie that we talk about. That's right. I, I, I started very, very early. This is the first movie I saw, in fact. Perfect. Your mom took you with. <laughs> I see. In 1914, P.G. Wodehouse's short story, Creatures of Impulse, was published, which introduced a valet by the name of Jeevans. Uh, like a valet? You can call it a valet if you want. A sure. valet. Which introduced a valet by the name of Jeevans, thought to be a prototype of the popular Jeeves character, who made his official debut the following year, and who Wodehouse would continue to write about for another 60 years into the mid-70s. Jeeves is the quintessential butler character, though technically he is a valet in Wodehouse's works, serving idle young Londoner Bertie Wooster. Jeeves has become nearly synonymous with elderly British servant characters, inspiring both a search engine and even his own listing in the Oxford English Dictionary. Does Ask Jeeves still exist? I don't know. Google let me ask, let, I'm going to Google it. <laughs> let, me, let me ask Jeeves. <laughs> oh, poor thing. <laughs> Hold on, let me Alta Vista that. <laughs> is that a verb? Well, I hope that this isn't what Ask Jeeves looks like. Oh, no. What it's a porn that? site now. It looks like a site from 1994. Yeah, that's the one. Maybe I think, maybe it just oh, became, became Ask.com. Ask. 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 Okay. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, make sure you spelled that one correctly, yeah. dude. You said Ask. <laughs> now I'm paranoid. Is valid not the proper way to pronounce the word? I've, I've heard it pronounced. Pernerst? <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not taking your word for it. It's a perfectly <laughs> cromulent word. <laughs> That's how I've always pronounced it. Oh, shit. I, I've always thought it was valet, but you know? Yeah. Well, valet is for parking cars, right? A yeah. valet is different. Yeah, so it, this cursory it, I, search. I, I asked ask.com. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it said to Google it. Um, <laughs> but it shows it here. Uh, preferred pronunciation is valet, but alternate pronunciation is valet. Okay. I'm Maybe it's a British thing. Then. They like to they like to mispronounce French words, right? That sounds right. This film story of Arthur and Hobson seems to draw directly from the relationship of Jeeves and Wooster from Wodehouse's long-running series. What blew me away researching the film is that one of its greatest strengths, the cast, were not the first choices by far. Arthur was written as an American, and the actors they went through on the way to Dudley Moore are all worlds away from the movie we got. Director Gordon's initial choice of lead was George Seagal. Okay. And surprisingly, this wasn't the first time that Dudley Moore would replace Seagal in a successful film. In 1979, Seagal was cast as the lead in Blake Edwards' 10, but quit the project when he felt that director Edwards was giving his wife Julie Andrews too big a part. The success of 10 is what landed Moore this role. So Seagal basically quit two movies that day, but between Seagal and Moore, many other actors were considered for the part and even offered the part. Actors considered but never officially offered the part included Jack Nicholson, Richard Dreyfuss, Michael Constantine, Charles Grodin, Burt Reynolds, Tom Selleck, Jeff Bridges, and now we dip into the Indiana Jones list a bit. So we have <laughs> Jeff Bridges, Chevy Chase, Steve Martin, Bill Murray, but then... Sylvester Stallone and Robin Williams at the end, which I can mm. see Robin Williams doing I can it. see Robin Williams. Yeah. I could also see um, Charles Grodin, I think, working. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's just, I mean, it's interesting, and I, it, which makes me wonder how much of the character 
was kind of developed by Dudley Moore right. versus written into the script because it, it they they don't seem like choices that I would have pulled out for this kind of character. Yeah. A direct offer was made to John Belushi, who turned it down, not wanting to be typecast as an alcoholic. Other actors who turned the part down included James Caan, Al Pacino, Robert Redford, and John Travolta. These are all straight guys. Like, mm-hmm. why? I don't like this. Doesn't feel like that kind of role. I agree. If, if the jokes were written into the script, yeah. You know? I don't think they were. I think a lot of the joking is is improvised. It's just him. Yeah. One other actor was offered the part and accepted it. Bud Court. Oh, really? Only huh. to withdraw prior to principal photography. I but could totally see that working. I think though. that works too. That, yeah. That actually would have been pretty good. Of all the people considered, I think Court's version would be the closest to what we eventually got. Though I would love to see the Charles Grodin version of this movie. Yeah. Where he's, because he's, like, you love him and you hate him at the same time. Like, he plays a jerk, but a very charismatic jerk. Yeah, exactly. Once Dudley Moore was officially cast, Gordon pushed for him to attempt an American accent. Moore was not comfortable with his pronunciation of American vowel sounds, and eventually convinced Gordon that the audience was smart enough to pick up on the implication that Arthur speaking with his valet's accent and not his father's meant that... He learned to speak from Hobson. And or not you just never dad. bothered to notice yeah. that that mattered. Because I'm like, whatever, he's a rich kid. He grew up in England. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know, whatever. <laughs> Moore based his drunken acting on his former comedic partner, Peter Cook, with whom he performed on stage as Pete and Dud, and who co-starred in the 1971 Bedazzled. Peter Cook played the devil in that Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always associate these two movies very closely. Yeah. Like, in, if you mention one, I will think of the other. Yep. So it's th- th- these two movies are tied, and I, I, I mean, obviously for sort of the style of movie as well as the actors. Yeah. Peter Cook's substance abuse and verbal abuse toward Moore caused the dissolving of their partnership in the late seventies. For the part of Hobson, Sir John Gilgood actually turned the role down because he didn't understand it. And Alec Guinness and David Niven were considered to replace him. Good choices. Yeah, I could see Alec Guinness doing this. They kept coming back to Gilgood with more money until he couldn't turn it down. Even on set, he had no idea what was funny about his lines and needed constant reassurance from his co-stars that what he was doing made sense. When he saw the finished film, he thought that Moore was slightly shouty at the start, but that in their scenes together, Moore was always sober, and he had nothing but kind words for Moore and Minnelli's work on set. For the part of Linda, apparently Kay Lenz campaigned hard for the role but was never brought in for it. Hmm. The filmmakers considered Mia Farrow, Farrah Fawcett, Goldie Hawn, Barbara Hershey, Diane Keaton, Jessica Lange, Bette Midler, Gilda Radner, Susan Sarandon, Sybil Shepard, and Meryl Streep. There's a handful in there I think would have done really well. I would have loved a Gilda Radner in there. I think Bette Midler would have been a lot of fun too. Yeah. I I think anybody that that, that, that had... That has that over the top kind of yeah. charm to them would have worked for this role, and they all do. Kim Basinger auditioned for the part, and at one point or another, it was officially offered to Tuesday Weld, Carrie Fisher, and Deborah Winger, who all turned it down. The script was set up at Paramount, but when Dudley Moore was cast, the studio backed out, and Orion picked it up. On a budget of just seven million dollars, it would gross ninety-five million at the box office, <laughs> ranking fourth in the domestic chart behind only Raiders, On Golden Pond, and Superman Two. Well, somebody got fired then at the other yeah, studio. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> As a result of its success, the film was granted a sequel, Arthur II on the Rocks, seven years later with most of the cast returning except for Jill Eikenberry as Moore's fiance Susan, who the character appears, but it's played by a different actress in the second film. You probably wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, writer-director Steve Gordon passed away shortly after the first film's release, and consequently the sequel kind of sucks. But I must admit the chemistry between Moore and Minnelli is still top notch. Oh, okay. So that's why this is his only yes. feature film? Yeah. Okay. Because when you said that, I was like, why? It was so good. Who yeah, wouldn't it was have really given good. him a second film? He should have worked more. It's yeah. a shame that he didn't get to. That's disappointing. In 2011, Warner Brothers released an equally lambasted remake starring British actor-comedian Russell Brand with actress-director Greta Gerwig as his love interest and Helen Mirren as Brand's Hobson. There are also three Indian remakes of the film, released like the American series, with two in the 80s and one in the 2000s. There are apparently three alternate endings, because director Gordon couldn't decide whether to focus the close of the film on Arthur's relationship with Hobson or Linda. After a test screening of a Hobson ending, Moore objected, preferring to finish the film with the story of Arthur's new relationship rather than the ending of the old relationship. Mm -hmm. Arthur was nominated for four Oscars, 
actor for Moore, supporting for Gilgood, screenplay for Gordon, and best original song for Arthur's theme, The Best That You Can Do. It won half the awards, with a statue for Gilgood and the song, but the song's nomination was not without its share of controversy. The operative term of the best original song category has always been the word original, and more recently an issue cropped up with the 2008 nomination of Glenn Hansert and Marquetta Urglova's Falling Slowly off the Once soundtrack. An accusation was made that an early version of the song was used in a film trailer from 2006, but because Once took so long to make, they were able to prove that it was written for Once originally, despite appearing elsewhere before Once's release in theaters. Oh, interesting. With regard to Arthur's theme, Liza Minnelli's ex-husband, Peter Allen, was on board a flight stuck in a holding pattern over New York, and he scribbled down the lyric, When you get caught between the moon and New York City, the best that you can do is fall in love. The line was developed by Allen with Carol Bayer Sager into an unreleased song before the song on this soundtrack. Hmm. But it was unreleased. So, I, so we're saying that original song just means that it, it has to be written for the movie and it can't have been performed elsewhere before the movie was released but if it's written and unreleased and then used in the movie is that written for the movie i think so okay if it wasn't released anywhere that it turned right. a profit before okay. that then yes during the production of arthur alan recommended the lyric to the theme song's writers sager burt Bacharach, and christopher cross who insisted that alan take a credit on the finished song for his contribution because the previous Alan Sager song was never released, and because Alan was properly credited among the songwriters, the Academy ruled that the song was eligible, and that's how Peter Allen won an Oscar for that one little poetic line that he wrote on an airplane. Hmm. Coincidentally, as we are recording this, a storm named Dudley has struck Scotland and northern England and has knocked out power to thousands of homes across the UK. I noticed this because I kept running into jokes about dudley moore with the hashtag storm dudley or <laughs> dudley storm we open with the oscar-winning theme over chauffeur bitterman driving millionaire arthur down a dark new york street in a 1956 rolls royce silver wraith even from outside the car arthur's hysterical drunken laughter is audible they pass a few theater marquees did you guys catch any of the titles here oh it's no I didn't. deep throat yeah <laughs> The first one is a double feature of Gerard Damiano's golden era porn titles, Deep Throat and The Devil in Miss Jones, a play on the 1941 The Devil and Miss Jones. In looking up an interview with the director to be certain I was pronouncing his name right, one of the first results was a reporter standing under this exact marquee at the Frisco Theater. Oh, wow. Behind me are two movies which have been playing continuously at this one theater near Times Square for almost 10 years. Deep Throat and the devil and miss jones unfortunately the reporter goes on to butcher the director's name so i had to keep looking <laughs> this okay this makes it less impressive that it was the same marquee if it's been playing there for 10 yeah, years exactly <laughs> they were both directed by the same man jerry damiamo <laughs> way off <laughs> arthur's chauffeur bitterman pulls up to Tayamo cigars to allow arthur a chance to speak with a couple of ladies on the street corner he's wearing a tuxedo with a full top and tails liquor glass in hand in the 2011 remake russell brand dons a similar top hat but it's explained in an earlier scene that it is abe lincoln's top hat from his second <laughs> state of the union which arthur won at an auction by repeatedly outbidding himself one of the prostitutes asks what he's looking for and after a few joke answers he admits he wants company for the night it's gonna cost you a hundred dollars oh yeah what time did you get off work <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding i'm kidding Let's make it $200, but I will ask you to simonize my car. <laughs> the admittedly infectious laugh he does here reminds me a lot of Ricky Gervais's particular brand of laughing at his own jokes, and it occurred to me that he must have been offered the part for the remake. I, I was going to say, that would have been a better remake. Yeah. When I, I looked think. it up, he was offered the okay. part, and he told them to go fuck themselves, because he was like, I love that movie, I'm not going to fuck it up. Oh, okay. Arthur finally coaxes one of the girls into the Rolls Royce, but orders Bitterman to award the other girl a consolation prize. Bitterman, give her, give her friend a hundred dollars. She came in second. The silver medalist recognizes Arthur from the paper and asks Bitterman if there's something wrong with him. After a moment of introspection, Bitterman admits that there definitely is. On the way home, Arthur gets the girl, Gloria, to his level of drunkenness. When they pull up to the plaza, Arthur falls flat on his face out of the car. He and Gloria find it very funny, but Bitterman is upset with the doorman for opening the door and letting Arthur hit the ground. Other onlookers seem amused, and even Bitterman eventually finds the humor in it. 
They step into the hotel restaurant, and when Gloria enters first, the maitre d' tries to throw her out until he sees who she's here with. We have your regular table, Mr. Oh, Bar. I oh, know you have it, but is anyone sitting at it? <laughs> on the way to his table, Arthur spots his aunt and uncle, who try to be polite but eventually call him out on his behavior. At their table, Gloria comes out with the obvious question. So, how rich are you? All I can tell you is, I wish I had a dime for every dime I have. We'll learn later that his father's estate is valued around $750 million, which is the equivalent of $2.3 billion today. He asks what she does for work because apparently he forgot. Are you a hooker? Jesus, I forgot. I just thought I was doing great with you. He admits to Gloria that he's being forced by his family to marry a woman named Susan Johnson. Then he quickly changes the subject to find out why she's a hooker. My mother died when I was six. Son of a bitch! Off to a bad start, Arthur. My father raped me when I was 12. So you had six relatively good years? He asks Gloria if she really likes him, and she answers seemingly honestly that she does. We cut to a model train moving through a tunnel, standard symbolism, and then the camera tracks to Arthur and Gloria in bed together. She wakes him and then slaps a button to stop the train. A pair of elevator doors open on the wall, and Arthur's valet Hobson, played by John Gilgood, steps into the room with a platter of breakfast, including a hangover remedy. I've taken the liberty of anticipating your condition, and I've brought you orange juice, coffee, and aspirins, or do you need to throw up? Arthur introduces Gloria to his best friend in the world, Hobson. Hobson is a bit patronizing to the girl, but this clearly isn't his first hodio. Whoa. I mean, she's a prostitute. Okay. He introduces Gloria to the concept of a robe and instructs Arthur to say his goodbyes. Once she's gone, Arthur announces a decree. Do you know what I'm going to do? No, I don't. I'm going to take a bath. I'll alert the media. Arthur asks him to please start the water running, and Hobson sarcastically accepts the task with no intention of following through. It's clear Hobson knows exactly what he can get away with. Perhaps you'd like me to come in there and wash your dick for you, you little shit. <laughs> such a great line. It's like the best thing he says in the whole movie, actually. In the tub, overflowing with bubbles, Arthur sings a bit of Santa Claus is Coming to Town before flipping a switch to Paige Hobson. He orders drinks because he refuses to meet with his father sober, and he has an appointment this morning. Hobson suspects that father's goal is to talk Arthur into the arranged marriage, and we get our first hint of foreshadowing. Arthur, I don't want you to be alone. I'll never be alone. I have you. And Hobson has an uncomfortable reaction to the line before tossing off a joke. God, isn't life wonderful, Hobson? Yes, Arthur, it is. Do your armpits. We cut to Arthur and Hobson waiting outside Arthur's father's office. Hobson promises Arthur ice cream after the meeting to cheer him up. After Arthur heads inside, an executive on a phone criticizes Arthur's drunken debauchery, seemingly to someone over the phone, but Hobson responds anyway as if he's speaking directly to him. He gets all that money, pays his family back by, by, by being a stinking drunk. It's enough to make you sick. I really wouldn't know, sir. I'm just a servant. Yeah. On the other hand, go screw yourself. Arthur's dad, Mr. Bach, reads some of Arthur's newspaper clippings to him. As Hobson suspected, dad is demanding Arthur marry Susan, and when Arthur refuses again, dad tells him that he's officially cut off from the family fortune. On father's desk are two framed photographs, President Truman and an autographed photo of Sir Winston Churchill, which I think also implies that Arthur's deceased mother may come from upper class mm. British heritage. Mm. And so maybe that's another part of why he has a British accent. Yeah. Arthur sticks to his decision, claiming he will marry someone when he loves them. I respect your integrity. You've just lost $750 million. Actually, Susan is a very nice girl. Very nice. They take turns listing all of Susan's terrific qualities and Mr. Bach gives Arthur his grandmother's ring, entrusting him to propose to her with it. Arthur and his father congratulate each other. We cut to the show floor at Bergdorf Goodman, where Arthur is buying a shitload of clothes he doesn't need or want, seemingly from muscle memory. He notices a woman in a yellow jacket and red cowboy hat stuffing ties into her Ferrari duffel bag. He points out the brilliant tactic to Hobson. It's a perfect crime. Girls don't wear ties. <laughs> Some girls wear ties. It's almost the perfect crime. <laughs> <laughs> 
Arthur is equally excited to see a guard following the woman around the store and out onto the street. Arthur and Hobson stand at a safe distance and watch the shoplifter, played by Liza Minnelli, chew out the guard for his accusation and threaten to get him fired or worse, arrested. The man has no patience for her antics. Finally, Arthur steps in to save the day, claiming to be a friend of hers. To prove it, he starts making out with her, since she can't deny him without giving herself away. Not in front of all these people, dear. <laughs> they might think you're an animal. Russell Brand does the same trick in the remake, but instead of stealing ties, Linda, Naomi in that film, is conducting an unlicensed tour group because theft isn't funny anymore, I guess. Darling, you don't want these people to think that you're some kind of random British pervert. No, I'm a very specific British pervert, which is why you <laughs> fell in love with me from our first date. But which was where, exactly? The guard at Bergdorf agrees to put the tie on Arthur Bach's tab and send them on their way. When everyone is left, Arthur asks why she took the tie, and she wants to know why he's so curious. She compares him to one of Santa's little helpers, <laughs> which he would go on to play four years later in Santa Claus the Movie. As she steps onto the city bus, she compliments Arthur's interesting kiss. It's an interesting kiss. Kiss your wife like that? I'm not married. She slaps the bus, giving it permission to pull away, and she steps across to Arthur to give him her phone number and permission to see her again. Eventually, she explains that the tie is for her father, and Arthur asks what she's doing tomorrow night. Oh, I have plans for tomorrow night. What should I wear? Seal something casual. <laughs> Arthur offers Bitterman to drive Linda home. When they get to her apartment building, Linda asks Bitterman if they can wait for one of her neighbors to walk by, and he offers her the entire treatment. He stops Linda from opening her own door so that he can do everything for her. Why, hello, Mrs. Nesbitt. Will that be all, man? I think so. Have a nice evening, Mrs. Nesbitt. Is that the same name as the uh, the character that Buzz Lightyear is having tea with? Mrs. Uh, Nesbitt. I, yeah, that yeah. sounds right. Yeah. Oh, I, th I think he is Mrs. Nesbitt. Oh, he's oh, Mrs. Nesbitt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. You see the hat? I am Mrs. Nesbitt. <laughs> Snap out of it, Buzz! <laughs> Inside the house, Linda's father shakes the gift-wrapped tie box, but guesses what it is before he unwraps it. She starts to tell him about the guy she met, and Dad wants to know the man's line of work. He's disappointed to hear that Arthur doesn't do much of anything until Linda explains the comment. Dad, he's a millionaire. You have my permission to marry him. We cut to Arthur at a flower shop making an insane order of roses. The salesperson asks him on his way out what it's like to be so rich. How does it feel to have all that money? It feels great. A dumb question. We cut to the Rockefeller Roof Gardens, a popular shooting location that appears famously in Spider-Man and John Wick 2. Arthur and Linda are attempting a conversation, but are repeatedly drowned out by a trio of musicians performing closer and closer to their table. By the end of the scene, instead of getting angry, they surrender to the music. I love this song! I love it too! <laughs> now we cut to some kind of a games parlor, where Arthur is standing at a small shooting gallery, firing a laser shotgun at an animatronic bear and winning a pile of coupons. He hits the bear 19 out of 20 times and takes his winnings to buy Linda an amorphous orange stuffed animal. I, I assumed this was like a place like Coney Island or... Yeah, but it's in the middle of the city. It's not on the shore hmm. because the address is posted on the wall behind the prizes. Ah. It looks like it's like a dorm now or there's dorms in the building. As they drive around that night, Arthur tells Linda that he's never taken care of anyone before, but he would take care of Linda if she needed it. The next day, Arthur visits his Aunt Martha to explain that he can't marry Susan because he just met a new woman. Martha doesn't understand the problem. Marry Susan and cheat with the nobody from Queens. We cut to Linda's apartment and the phone is ringing. Arthur has called to inform her that he will be proposing to a woman tonight. Linda doesn't wait around for an explanation and rushes him off the phone. On the other end of the call, we see Arthur on the verge of tears at what he's done, and we cut back to Linda's place, and it's not Linda, but her father who needs consoling at the loss of their golden goose. I'll be all right, sweetheart. I, I, I just have to be alone for a minute. Oh, God, I can't bear it. That's a really funny reveal. <laughs> he, he's great in this movie. He yeah. does an excellent job, her father. Arthur gives Bitterman the night off, prepared to drive to the engagement dinner himself. Arthur asks after Hobson. Where's Mr. Hobson? Uh, Mr. Hobson was tired, sir. He's resting. He's been tired quite a bit lately, Bitterman. Oh, I'm sure he's fine, sir. Arthur goes to check on Hobson, who keeps pretending to die and making jokes about a brain tumor. It's Arthur's turn to have his patients worn thin. Oh, 
God, Hobson, please, don't die anymore. It's getting very boring. Arthur tells Hobson that he admitted the truth to Linda, and Hobson says the cruelest thing we'll hear from him. I don't know why. A little tart like that could save you a fortune in prostitutes. Not only is it mean, but it doesn't make very much sense either because Arthur has three quarters of a billion dollars, and I can't imagine he's super concerned about his poon budget. Like, just well, goes out. He doesn't. He could hire three women if he wanted to every night. He doesn't care. But that's the point. Like he he would he wouldn't have to pay for Linda. So he but who cares? Save. Money is nothing to him. <laughs> Arthur is pushed over the line and shouts at Hobson for being such a snob before marching out of the room. Though he does immediately creep back in to apologize for raising his voice, which he claims is the first time that he's ever done that. Mm-hmm. So I guess usually he's annoying Hobson, and this is the first time Hobson's pushed him over the line. Yeah, but I think that this was a test, though. You know. Oh, from Hobson? I think so. I mean, that's the way I take it after he's like, oh, you actually care about this person because you got mad at me. So, yeah, like, I, I didn't think that it was a test so much as just their regular system of making fun of each other. Yeah. And then he realized this was a different reaction than he normally I guess gets. it became a test if it yeah. wasn't intended to be because that's, you know, it helped him realize how he felt. And he apologized. Yeah, he apologizes right away and he knows that he's touched a nerve with Arthur. We cut to Arthur drinking and driving over to Susan Johnson's place. The only measure by which this film fails and the reboot succeeds is in showing that alcohol abuse is unhealthy and dangerous. In the Russell Brand movie, Arthur gets dragged to an AA meeting and is forced to hear people's awful tragedies. And it's something that this film just kind of glosses over. It's never sad when he goes back to drinking because alcoholism never has any real negative consequences for him Mm -hmm. in the film. Mm -hmm. And he's just as smart drunk as he is sober. The only difference is that he's slurring his words a little. Susan's butler invites Arthur into their library, and of course he requests another glass of scotch, even though he's already sloshed. Left alone in the room, Arthur chats a bit with a taxidermied moose head on the wall. Instead of Susan, her father, Mr. Johnson, steps into the room. Arthur offers him a drink to even the playing field, but Mr. Johnson claims never to drink, despite keeping plenty of spirits on hand. I I was kind of wondering about that. I'm like, why do you have this full bar when you don't approve of drinking? Well, By the end of the scene, I, I realize that it's to take advantage of people in this room. Oh, that maybe. It's like, that makes sense. I get you drunk, and then I make my business deal, and then I get what I wanted, and you don't. In this very threatening room. Right. Where's the rest of this moose? Yeah. <laughs> the two of them are now face-to-face under the enormous moose head. I don't drink because drinking affects your decision-making. You may be right. I can't decide. It's <laughs> <coughs> just a little humor. <laughs> Where's the rest of this moose? <laughs> Supposedly, Stephen Elliott playing Mr. Johnson here was tired of doing take after take with all the improv going on. And so when he shouts, Why don't you forget the moose for a moment? He was legitimately upset. But it seems completely in character to me. And I don't know why IMDb trivia is so overloaded with these kinds of factoids. Wow, that anger seemed real. I'm going to tell IMDb it was real. <laughs> it's like, no, he's an actor. That's just the line that he said in the movie. Mr. Johnson explains to Arthur that, unlike him, he is a self-made man. He confesses to having killed a man at 11, stabbed him to death to protect his family's food. All of this is on the way to explaining how protective he can be of the things he values, and his daughter, Susan, is his most prized possession. But, I, like, what I don't fully understand the desire for this union by anybody be- aside from Susan. Like, I think Susan just loves him. That's Susan, all. Susan legitimately loves him, but why does his family care? Why does Why are they not talking her out of it? I don't know. Like, yeah, Susan's family should talk her out of it. I, I mean, aside from the fact that her dad wants to give her everything she ever wanted. I, I think that's but literally all it boils why, down to. Why is Arthur's family so insistent on this marriage? That's true. I don't know if that's made clear enough in the second movie or i'm not the second movie but in the reboot they're kind of reliant on this other family for a merger that's going on for their company to survive Mm. which makes a little bit more sense that that these companies actually rely on each other which is why they're trying to force their kids together okay but in this movie you're right arthur's family seems well off enough they shouldn't need anything from these people yeah and i like i know that they want the best for him and they want him to sort of straighten out and you know grow up and all this stuff but i i don't know why marrying susan would make all the difference i think it's just a it's upper class lower class thing they don't want him to marry outside of of his uh income level Mm -hmm. and it's basically like an aladdin story oh you can only marry a prince why because you that's the thing even if i seem like a nice parent all the time This is a rule that I'm sticking to until I decide randomly that I'm done sticking to that rule. Yeah. 
Mr. Johnson tells Arthur that he expects him to take a job at the company and stop drinking. We cut away to Arthur and Susan at their planned engagement dinner, and Susan is offering Arthur a long leash. You can get drunk, you can throw up, you can forget to call me for months. You can't lose with me. I'm not sure what she gets out of this, since she knows that he doesn't care for her, and she doesn't seem to need his affection if she's okay with him being missing for months. She's already rich, so she doesn't need his money unless she just wants more, but couldn't any millionaire offer her that? Yeah. Right on the heels of giving him permission to get drunk, she asks him to stop drinking. This is what I am. Everyone who drinks is not a poet. Some of us drink because we're not poets. Which is a fairly poetic line for a disavowed poet to whip out, but on closer inspection, it doesn't actually make a lot of sense. Do people think that everyone who drinks is a poet? I've never heard the every drunk is a poet stereotype. I think, uh... It seems to come from a, a kind of like stereotype of all these famous writers are famous alcoholics. But I think that's the other way around, that writers are famously alcoholics, but I don't think alcoholics are famously writers. That's true. And Arthur is also the wittiest person in this movie, so it's weird for him to pretend that he's incapable of speaking poetically when it's really the only thing he does in every scene. A real woman could stop you from drinking. You have to be a real big woman. <laughs> That's another great line. He presents her with his family ring, and she's moved to tears, even though this is all planned out, basically. He proposes, and as soon as she accepts, he asks for permission to drunk drive home. He skids up outside Linda's building, shouting her name at the exterior. Inside, he stumbles past an empty stroller in a stairwell, but pretends to tease a baby in it. He picks a random door to pound on at 3 a.m., but it's the wrong one. Linda! What do you want? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> a woman in curlers screeches threats in Arthur's face. My husband oh, oh, has a gun! Oh, so it has, madam. Uh, for all I know, he shot it while you scream. <laughs> <laughs> she shouts her husband Perry to the door, and Arthur repeats that he's looking for Linda. Somehow Perry knows her full address, and lucky for him, Mrs. Perry doesn't question it at all. <laughs> it's like, wait, why do you know exactly the apartment number for Linda? On his way out of the building. Because it's not their building. Right. It's, yeah. it's next yeah. door and it's on a different floor. So it's weird that he Because people knew their neighbors better back in the 80s. On the way out of the building, Arthur collects a small blanket and tosses it over the imaginary baby to protect it from the woman screaming. You shouldn't hear this. He stumbles over to Linda's place and asks her father if he hates Perry's wife. <laughs> and I think <laughs> it seems from his face like he agrees. Like, oh yeah, I know who you're talking about. Linda invites him in, and he knocks some of their belongings off of a shelf, and then spends like 30 seconds trying to put this one thing back together. <laughs> this is a goner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, eventually, he gives up on it, and Linda walks to her bedroom, but Arthur follows her. He doesn't pick up on her signals, and he keeps trying to kiss her, assuring her that she shouldn't be a waitress forever, but she tells him she has grand plans of being an actress, and he pushes an envelope into her hand. Her father listens from the door, as she reads the check inside. A hundred thousand dollars. And we hear her dad scream through the door, but when we cut outside, he's got his fist in his mouth. <laughs> he's trying to keep quiet. She hands him the check back, and he reminds her that the money could do wonders for her. Yeah, look what it's done for you. She tells him to leave, and he accidentally stumbles into her closet for a while. We cut to Arthur circling a racetrack the next day. When he's all done, he starts complaining to Hobson, who asks him to remove his helmet and goggles. As soon as Arthur is unprotected, Hobson tries to smack some sense into him. You spoiled little bastard. You're a man who has everything, haven't you? He begs Arthur to stop feeling sorry for himself and just marry Susan already. He tells him the horrors of being a poor drunk. Uh, that's one of my favorite scenes because it has one of my favorite lines from Hobson. Everyone is unloved. The world is unloved. Incidentally, I love you. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you feel really bad for Hobson, that line. Because it's like, this is where Arthur was supposed to say, oh, I love you too, Hobson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't yeah. say anything there. The next day, we cut to Hobson standing at Linda's door. He sends her father on a tea-making errand and slips Linda the address of tonight's engagement party. Why, are all the ones who passed up coming? <laughs> Young woman, this is a tie you cannot steal. This is a tie I'm afraid you're going to have to work for. She's obviously reluctant to attend, and as Hobson makes an effort to insist, he is launched into a coughing fit. Hobson takes a seat and explains that he wasn't sent by Arthur. You really look out for him, don't you? Yes, and it is a job that I recommend... Highly. Before he leaves, he presents Linda with one last gift, 
Dad comes back with the tea and Hobson claims to hate tea and asks for aspirin. Hobson continues coughing all the way to the door. That sounds bad. Have you seen a doctor? Yes. And he has seen me. She asks Hobson if she can kiss him on the cheek, and he reluctantly allows it. May I kiss you on the cheek? Is it something you feel strongly about? As he leaves, Linda reminds him about the aspirin, but Hobson says that they're for her. We cut to the engagement party. Linda pulls up outside in a taxi, and she's wearing a very nice dress, which is probably the gift that Hobson presented her with. Inside, Arthur is coaxed to the piano. He's clearly a skilled pianist, but his first song is the same one he sang in the tub earlier. You'd better watch out. You'd better not cry. Was this a Christmas movie? I don't think <laughs> yeah, so. It came out in July. <laughs> but it's, I guess it's supposed to be taking place either just before or just after New Year's. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a lot of Christmas decorations anywhere, but this is twice that we've sang about Santa and people yeah. are exchanging a lot of gifts if this isn't a Christmas movie. This is the first scene we get of Arthur really in his element. The entire room is amused by his every comment. When he notices Linda across the room, he takes a break from the piano, and Linda starts talking up a random party guest named Preston to imply that she came here as his guest. They both give Preston their drink orders so they can have a chance to chat. Arthur offers her a tour of the place, and across the party, Susan's father seems to have already made a dossier on Linda. He knows everything about her and shares the information with Aunt Martha and Arthur's dad. Arthur takes Linda down to the stables, and they joke around amongst the horses. They talk about their childhood misconceptions of the world, and Linda admits that for some time she believed that the moon was following her around. Arthur asks permission for a kiss this time, but he walks past her to kiss the horse Poncho. (laughs) He almost pitches Linda his family's plan of buying her an apartment in the city so they can carry on an affair in spite of the marriage, but he aborts the plan mid-sentence, right before the lights flick on and Susan enters the room. She seems prepared to ignore what's going on here, but Linda concocts a whole backstory that she was here to borrow money from Arthur in secret because her husband is in terrible gambling debt and she's drowning in bills with sick children. Susan seems to buy the whole story completely, but insists that she never thought anything was amiss between them. She only came down to pass along news of an urgent phone call from Bitterman. We cut to the hospital where Arthur and Bitterman wait worried in a hallway. Arthur gives Bitterman some tasks to do, a phone tree to work through, and Bitterman is to announce a delay of the wedding. Arthur heads into Hobson's room and offers to open a pile of presents on the bed beside him. Gifts include a basketball and a toy train. At first you think uh, Hobson is like, oh, a basketball. Like, I don't want that. But then at one point when he starts having a coughing fit, he he reaches for it. He picks up the ball, yeah. (laughs) He cradles it. it. Well, I I love this scene, though, because, you know, obviously this is the start of where Arthur has to, you know actually take care of yeah somebody. actually take care of somebody aside from himself but it it also still feels like he's a child yeah. you know because he's he's obviously buying childish gifts um you know but it's this it's the, it's that innocence of i just want you to feel better and these are the things that would make me feel better right exactly and it's also the most childish we see hobson because when he gets this train he's like you got me a choo-choo i love it <laughs> like he's like so excited about the train Arthur reminds Hobson of the time they spent playing hide-and-seek in his childhood. Do you remember when you used to play hide-and-seek with me? I used to hide and you never found me. Did you know I never looked? Come on. Well, I looked a little. (laughs) (laughs) The next gift contains two cowboy hats, and Arthur forces Hobson to put it on so they can be cowboys together. I'll put it on. If I begin to die, please take this off my head. This is not the way I wish to be remembered. (laughs) (laughs) Arthur got guns to go with the cowboy hats, and suddenly Hobson cuts through the scene to admit that he's genuinely frightened of death, but Arthur promises to take care of him, a task Arthur has never been trusted with. Sometime later, Arthur seems to have transported Hobson's entire room here into the hospital. An orderly brings Hobson breakfast, and Arthur orders him a fancy lunch through a restaurant in the city, refusing to allow Hobson's final meal to be hospital food. Arthur, by the way, has managed to remain sober during these caretaking days. As Arthur pours him coffee, Hobson admits that he has come to terms with the end, and in a way, it's a relief. Hobson reminds Arthur that he has a full life ahead of him, and he could do whatever he wants with it, and hints that he should spend more of it with Linda. He tells Arthur that he's a good son, and somehow... In earlier viewings of this film, I completely missed this line and thought he was telling Arthur on behalf of Arthur's biological father that you're a good son to him. 
And it, it didn't hit me until this watch. Oh, it, that he's it, oh, that he yeah. considers exactly. him his own son. Oh, it hit me so hard because you know this movie is hilarious. It like, is. I, I'm laughing hysterically throughout, and then you know this line just killed me. I'm it's like, a total it's, gut punch. It's. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure there was a, a, an actual tear. At, yeah. When he said this, and I even just, even Arthur is like really hit hard by the line, but that's the last line of the scene there. Later in Hobson's room at home, Arthur plays chess alone. All of his stuff being back here, of course, implying that yeah. Hobson has passed and his his belongings have been returned to their property. A dim spotlight shines down on Hobson's pillows as if his presence can still be felt here. Arthur locks the room up tight and we're meant to understand that Hobson has passed. And in the second film, seven years later, Hobson's room has remained locked this entire time and the replacement valet is forced to stay in a much smaller room across the hall to make room for Hobson's live-in ghost. We cut to a bar where Arthur can now drink to his heart's content without an obligation to anyone. He and a fellow bar patron are wasted, and Arthur confides in the man that his father has died, touchingly responding to Hobson's invitation of an implied adoption. They try to do something like this in the remake, but they flub it a lot. Because the Valet character is meant to be a surrogate parent for Arthur, when they gender-swapped Arthur's Valet to cast Helen Mirren as Hobson, they also had to switch his living parent to his mother. Yeah. In this film, Arthur tells a complete stranger that his dad died, which doesn't matter because it's a stranger. You can tell them whatever you want, and it's more about what he's observing about himself. Yeah. But in the remake, Russell tells Linda, who, again, has been renamed Naomi for some reason in the remake. My mom's dead. I know. It makes less sense, I think, to use the wrong term as a metaphor, especially since in that film Naomi had already met Hobson and his mother. So like his to go there, mother? yeah, and to say my mom died, yeah. and it's like I know that like somehow Naomi has processed that he's talking about someone else and not his own mom. Well, I suppose it depends on how she says I know. Yeah. Because I mean, you could say, you know, I know. Like it like I I know that that's Yeah, but that's mom. not how she says it. Okay. <laughs> it's more like uh Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, she makes it sound like, oh, no, that news got to me. When I think what this character would actually be thinking would be like, wait, your your mom died also? Or are you saying, or are you referring to her as your mom? Yeah. In this film, Arthur shares with his new bar friend that he doesn't love the woman he's about to marry and instead tells the man how great Linda is. Bitterman enters to take Arthur to his wedding and we cut to St. Bart's in Manhattan. On the front steps, Mr. Johnson assures Arthur's dad that if Arthur is a no-show, he will kill him. We cut to a crowded diner where customers are yelling out reminders of their orders to Linda. Arthur pops into the place dressed for the wedding, complete with the top hat again, and slurs his words to ask Linda to consider spending the rest of her life with him. An impatient customer eavesdrops on their chat. I want to marry you. Although I'm supposed to marry Susan in 20 minutes. You know, he seems drunk, but he sounds sincere. Teacher roll. Yeah. Can you take the next 60 years off? I'll have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur makes an official proposal. I'll try to be sober, and I'll try to make you happy, although it won't, won't be easy, because I'll be poor. We'll be poor. Oh, we'll be poor. Most people are poor. Eat your roll! <laughs> Back at the church, Arthur sneaks in once everyone's seated. They're relieved to see the groom here. He asks for directions to the wedding party, and is pointed off to the side of the church. He surprises Susan for a little chat. He asks for some privacy from her bridesmaids, but they don't go far. He tells her that he's in love with someone else, and he won't be going through with the wedding. She screams for her father, and he comes running instantly. We cut back to the wedding guests, and they can hear a ruckus elsewhere in the church, glass shattering, etc. It reminds me of when the Ghostbusters are catching Slimer in the Sedgwick Hotel ballroom, and Michael Ensign can just hear them destroying everything inside. We cut back to the room, and it's clear that Mr. Johnson has just punched Arthur over a table and isn't finished. Arthur's face is bleeding all over. Susan tries to yank off the engagement ring when she notices Linda come through the door to find them. Linda admits that she's the one Arthur loves, but Susan still believes the gambling debt story. What about Harold? Harold? Oh, you poor thing. Nice time to Mr. Johnson punches Arthur into another backward somersault before Susan moves to intervene, recognizing that her father has lost it. Mr. Johnson shouts everyone else out of the room and grabs a sharp knife from a cheese plate preparing to reenact the climax of his childhood story about killing a man to defend what's his. Arthur is hopeful that maybe Johnson isn't out for murder. It's like a knife out of the cheese. You think he wants some cheese? No, I think 
Wait, we're gonna die. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love how how optimistic he is all the time. Oh, maybe he just wants a slice yeah. of cheese. He's like, I think it's more he's hoping. He's like, he's taking the knife out of the cheese. Do you think he wants some cheese? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so great. Johnson is in a murderous trance, approaching Arthur and Linda with a knife until Aunt Martha walks in and slaps him hard to wake him up. Arthur heads out to address the crowd and inform them that the wedding is off, that Susan has dumped him, and he informs them that he likely won't see them again because he will be poor as a result of today's decision. We dissolve to the same church hours later, emptied except for Arthur and Linda at the altar, and she tries to dress his wounds. They do some jokey vows back and forth, and we notice that Aunt Martha has stayed behind to observe the couple. Arthur and Linda make plans for their upcoming poverty, and when Martha hears him talking about a job and fast food, she's heard enough. That is out of the been such a thing as a working oh. class back and there never will be martha tells arthur that he doesn't have to go without the money after all arthur takes some time to think about it because the money hasn't made him happy so far martha demands a decision immediately and at the last second he relents and accepts the money he doubles bitterman's salary and asks for a drive through the park and we get our closing credits that's the end of the film this movie is great. It's really yeah. wonderful. I loved it the whole way through. I mean, I, I feel bad because I have very little to say on it as you're as you're recounting the story because it's just it's just perfect. It's like, just a really tight story. Yeah, the, the characters are wonderful. The, the cast is jokes. perfect. I just I, everything about this movie is great. I, I I don't feel like I've laughed this hard at a movie in a very long time. Yeah. And I, I had seen it before, so like it's still and it was, funny. I mean, aside from, you know, we talked about the potential like general inspirations of the story. This is a really like great original story for the year. And of the top four movies, like Raiders is original, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And On Golden Pond is original, but obviously you can't do a sequel to that. <laughs> but but and Superman is is an adaptation and a sequel. But this is this is just a brand new original story that was, I think, intended as just a one off when Mm -hmm. they put it together and it's just really great everything everything works um i know we joked about it earlier but uh i actually did grow up with this movie yeah Uh, and uh it was a staple of my of my household my mom and dad both really love this movie so they watched it all the time uh so i've seen it many many times and uh i think the way that dudley moore and liza minnelli just play off each other is so amazing Uh, especially that first meeting when they neither of them skip a beat Right. Like, there's no, like, there's none of that, like, wait, what's going on? Oh, I'll yeah, play they along. know exactly no. what they're doing. She just immediately is is taking his cues and going with it. Yeah, I think the chemistry between Russell Brand and Greta Gerwig in the remake does not come close to this because I think it's harder to connect with Russell Brand that way. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, these two seem like they were in a real-life relationship behind the scenes, which is not the case, but they just feel, like, so perfectly matched with each other. Yeah. And I'm glad that they eventually talked to Gilgren into doing this. I mean, it would have been okay with uh, Guinness, Alec Guinness yeah. as the butler character, but I I don't think David Niven could have done it the same way because David Niven is is too like knowingly comedic. Where mm-hmm. Gilgood just ha- is so perfectly dry here that yeah, if they that hadn't made this with him, they would have had to wait around for Michael Goff to do this <laughs> character. <laughs> sure, <laughs> but yeah, I love it. Thumbs up for me. Oh, it's a huge thumbs up. This movie is great. Do you guys know your letterbox placement? Yeah. Um, I have this movie in number three. It is uh, below number three out of how many? Do we 91, have? I think. Yeah, 91. Three out of 91. It's below uh, The Great Muppet Caper and above Dragon Slayer. Richard, where you got it? Uh, I have it at number nine, uh, which puts it below Stripes, but above Atlantic City. I have it at number four. Um, it was either three or four. I, I went back and forth with Modern Romance a few times on this, but I'm keeping that where it is. Um, yeah, the, I know down, you guys don't down like in it. the dumps. But <laughs> uh, but this one just goes right after that. It's fourth out of ninety one, so it's just under Modern Romance and just above Thief. Our writer director was Steve Gordon. This was his first and last time directing. Obviously, he has writing credits on the 2011 remake as well as a character credit on Arthur Two on the Rocks, which was dedicated to his memory after he suffered a fatal heart attack just a year after the first film's release. He was only 44 years old. Ugh, yeah. that's tragic. The music here was composed by Burt Bacharach, 
His first Oscar nomination was for The Look of Love off the Casino Royale soundtrack, and his first win was for Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head from the Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids soundtrack. But his second win was for this. I don't. I didn't realize that any of those three were, were original songs to those songs movies. To yeah. Those movies. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for Casino Royale. Well, I mean... I would believe that that song came from the late 60s. So yeah, that, yeah. like temporally, that doesn't confuse me as much as as raindrops keep falling on my head coming from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance yeah. Kid. Because well, it, it's, it's not even, it doesn't make sense for that movie chronologically. <laughs> well, yeah, but it, it also is just frustrating that Casino Royale has an Oscar nomination. Yeah, at all. Yeah, it doesn't deserve anything. We're talking about the 1960s Casino Royale. Yeah. Not that the new one deserves any either. Oh. <laughs> I was going to make the same joke. <laughs> <laughs> Burt Bacharach also came back to score Arthur 2, and he appears as himself with Elvis Costello in Austin Powers 2 and 3. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Burt Bacharach and Mr. Elvis Costello. Cinematographer Fred Schuler, he recently lit Gloria and Stir Crazy for us last season. He's back to DP King of Comedy, Amityville 3D, Fletch, and Armed and Dangerous later. Editor Susan E. Morse previously cut The Warriors, Manhattan, and Stardust Memories. After this, she's back to mostly Woody Allen work with Midsummer Night Sex Comedy, z Broadway Danny Rose, Purple Rose of Cairo, Hannah and Her Sisters, Manhattan Murder Mystery, Deconstructing Harry, and Celebrity, among well, many others. Was Woody Allen on your list of people to play Arthur? I did not have him on that list. Well, I was, I was, like, like now in retrospect, that seems like another obvious... It does make sense, although he tends not to appear as the lead character after Casino Royale mm. in something that he didn't write or direct himself. That's true. Although I do remember we talked about uh, with Simon last year that he may have been up for the role in that film that eventually went to Austin Pendleton mm. because they're playing very similar characters there. Dudley Moore was Arthur Bach. He was Stanley Moon in Bedazzled. He was Stanley Tibbetts in Foul Play. He was George Weber in 10 before this. We saw him last season as Harvey and Herschel in Holy Moses, and after this, he returns for Blake Edwards' Mickey and Maud, Arthur II, and then he shows up in Crazy People. He's also the narrator of Milo and Otis. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's like always the thing that I think of yeah. after Arthur. Didn't you narrate that movie where they murdered hundreds of cats and dogs? <laughs> On the animated series The Critic, we get to see a little clip of the fictional Arthur III Revenge of the Liver. <laughs> Arthur, I'm afraid you have acute cirrhosis. And you have a cute little butt. <laughs> No, you don't understand. Your pancreas is swollen to the size of a basketball. Oh, no wonder I dribble so much. <laughs> this is very serious. You have less than a year to live. Oh, don't look now, but somebody's eaten all your popsicles. <laughs> Why, there's a piano. I've got a liver the size of coconuts. <laughs> I... <laughs> I... I always go back to the don't look now. Somebody's eaten all your popsicles. With I, I've always said the coconuts thing, and I didn't even remember what it was from until I watched this. But that's always the way I sing that song. <laughs> this was Moore's only Oscar nomination. Later in life, he developed a debilitating brain illness that caused permanent damage to his frontal lobe, causing him to slur his words, not unlike his character in the film. As a result, he gained a public reputation as an alcoholic, despite never being an active drinker. Liza Minnelli played Linda Marola. Obviously, she's the daughter of Judy Garland from Wizard of Oz. She appeared in Cabaret, Silent Movie, and New York, New York before this. She's most famous for her singing and dancing, but the bulk of her acting credits after the 80s are for her appearance as Lucille Ostero in Arrested Development. A <laughs> wonderful, wonderful character. She suffers from vertigo. <laughs> yeah, she's like constantly falling against the walls. <laughs> John Gilgood played Hobson. John and Gilgood are actually his middle and last name. Can you guess his first name? Arthur. It's Arthur. He co-starred in Caligula with Helen Mirren, who would take over the role of Hobson in the Russell Brand remake. Since Caligula, we've seen him already in The Elephant Man, The Lion in the Desert, The Formula, and Sphinx. And he's back later this season for Chariots of Fire and Priests of Love. This was his only Oscar win, but he didn't bother coming to the ceremony because he didn't think acting was a contest and that awards shows are a bunch of mutual congratulation baloney, and he was totally correct. Yeah. <laughs> he shows up in the sequel for dream sequences. Basically, like, Arthur gets really drunk in public, and suddenly Hobson is standing there to give but him some advice. But is it new footage, or is it old It's new footage, footage. Oh, okay. Yeah. He was around for a long time. He actually just passed away in, like, 2000 or something. He was 96 years old oh, when wow. he died. I didn't realize he was around that long. Yeah, because uh, when I was looking up his credits, 
Um, I was trying to remember who he was in the Gulliver's Travels uh, Ted Danson TV movie. Oh, he was in there? Yeah. I think he's like the professor of the sun or something like that. Oh, interesting. I'm trying to remember what, I don't know if he was the one who was in charge of the floating city uh, or if he was like in the weird college that he I don't know if I saw both nights of that. Oh, no? I just saw the first night. It's, I have fond memories of it. I'm sure if I watched it now, I'd be like, ugh, this is pretty terrible, but. It's not as good as the Jack Black Gulliver's Travels. Yeah. I don't think you can say something that happened 22 years ago is recent anymore. I can. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. If if John Gilgood survived into the 2000s, I'm, I'm allowed I, to say it. All right. I'm just saying, like, to, to say 2000 was 2000 recently, was yesterday. It makes you feel We're all real still old. young. <laughs> We're all still children, basically. <laughs> Geraldine Fitzgerald played Martha Bach. She's Isabella in Wuthering Heights. She's Anne King in Dark Victory. Grandma Jess in Poltergeist 2. And she returns to the franchise as Martha again in Arthur 2 on the Rocks. She has a lot more to do in the second film. And she's so funny. Yeah. Like she makes these silly smiles. And uh, she's much goofier in the second movie. She has like uh, a physical trainer who just comes in and exercises in front of her. And that's her exercise is just watching <laughs> this guy. And she keeps just talking about how cute he is to Arthur all the time. It's it's very funny. Jill Eikenberry played Susan Johnson. She was James Caan's wife in Hide in Plain Sight last season. She also appeared on L.A. Law with her husband, Michael Tucker. More recently, she was Hedda Gary in Diablo Cody's Young Adult. Stephen Elliott played Burt Johnson. He's Chief Hubbard in Beverly Hills Cop. He's the police commissioner in Death Wish. And he returns to the role of Burt Johnson for the sequel, Arthur II on the Rocks. We saw him earlier this season as murderer billionaire J.J. Cord in Cutter's Way. So yeah. he's basically the same character. <laughs> Ted Ross played Bitterman. He was the lion in The Wiz. He's Bitterman in Arthur 2, and he's Captain Reed in Police Academy. But I think the role that I recognize him from is as the limo bum in The Fisher King. Okay. Barney Martin played Ralph Marola. In addition to playing her father here, he also played Liza Minnelli's husband in the Broadway production of Chicago. He's also Jerry's dad on Seinfeld. Anna DeSalvo played Gloria. She was Sandy's sister in Stardust Memory. Sandy is the Woody Allen character. Maurice Copeland played Uncle Peter, uh, the one at the restaurant at the beginning who was disappointed in him. He'll be Jack Manners in Blowout later this season. He's also a pallbearer in Being There and the Secretary of Agriculture in Trading Places. Mary Ellen Hokanson played the secretary. She's Mrs. Lodge in Them and Ruth Barnes in V. Paul Gleason played Executive. That's the guy who was being shitty on the phone near John Gilgood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we've seen him so far in He Knows You're Alone and Fort Apache the Bronx, but he's likely best known as Principal Vernon in Breakfast Club, and then he reprised the role for Not Another Teen Movie. He's back later this season as Remsen in The Pursuit of D.B. Cooper. Irving Metzman played the security guard at Bergdorf Goodman. He was Richter in War Games. He's Sandy's lawyer in Stardust Memories, and he was Applebaum in Fort Apache the Bronx. Oh... Okay. I I knew I recognized him. I couldn't place it. Lou Jacoby played the plant store owner. He was Mr. Hans von Dan in The Diary of Anne Frank. Helen Hanft played Perry's wife, the screamy lady. She was a used car salesperson in Willie and Phil and Vivian Orkin, which is, I think, the woman who organized the festival for Woody Allen's director character in Stardust Memories. A lot of people from that movie in this movie. She's back as a bag lady in Honky Tonk Freeway later this season. Raymond Sarah played racetrack owner. He was Chief Stearns in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 and 2. Richard Hamilton played Bill. He was Earl Carpenter in Resurrection last season. He's Jed Blankenship in Pale Rider before that. But the role I know him best for is in his IMDb profile pick, which is D, original partner of K, at the start of the first Men in Black before Mm -hmm. J is recruited. George Riddle played Bartender. This was his second role after playing Mutton Chop Aid in Simon last season. There are huge gaps all through his filmography, three years off here, five years off there, and then the credit I recognized. George Riddle appeared on the Onion News Network in the incredible recurring role of political pundit Jode Kressbeckler, Mm -hmm. (laughs) an elderly Southern gentleman who's invited to share his old-fashioned but flowery opinions on all manner of subjects. Here are Jode's thoughts on (laughs) NASA's ballooning budget. (laughs) long as man's been hunting coons by starlight, he's been looking up and shouting, I want to go on that moon. And we did because we said we would. 
But now these space princes are going around demanding all the greenbacks of cotton carry so they can keep gallivanting in their rockets till the sedated spring from the mud. Well, it's time Molly Cottle in her bright pink parasol got ripped off a shitter and made to smell her own business. I'm getting joined by Ellie Granderson. She's going to put a feminine scope on these least kerchief star buggers and give us her lady opinion, Ellie. Hi, Joe. You know, it riles me up every time you walk in here, Ellie. <laughs> you set my blood to dancing with all your pillowy parts. <laughs> <laughs> but he talks like that just super fast and with this great old man voice it's really <laughs> incredible <laughs> i can't believe he can get through these long sections of script without screwing up at everything yeah. like it's just so much so many words in such a tight span of time and then he has this closing segment where he talks to this painting of his dead wife <laughs> It's really, it's like, what the fuck is this? Because they make it look like it's a Fox News Network thing. And then suddenly at the end, they roll out this huge oil painting of his wife. And he just talks to her about how he misses her. And that's the end of his, like, opinion segment. <laughs> Next character, Lawrence Tierney, played the man in the coffee shop who wants his role and keeps uh, interjecting in the conversation. He was Joe Cabot in Reservoir Dogs. He's Mike Carter in Bodyguard. Apparently, he's uncredited as Gramps in Armageddon. I don't know why he would go uncredited. And who Gramps would be. Yeah. But my favorite story is about how he was hired to play Elaine's father on Seinfeld, which was intended to be a recurring role, but he scared the shit out of everyone by stealing a knife on set. And then when Seinfeld confronted him, he pulled out the knife and pantomimed the stabbing scene from Psycho while insisting it was a joke. So they never asked him back. But he's the second of two Seinfeld dads in the cast hmm. after Barney Martin, who plays Jerry's dad. Mark Margolis was a wedding guest, uncredited, I for sure saw someone who looks exactly like Mark Margolis in the crowd, so I don't know if it was actually him, but considering the part is uncredited, it could have just been an extra who looked like him and someone put it on there. Mm. He's Chicka Dance in Ace Ventura. He's Mr. Rabinowitz in Requiem for a Dream, but he's best known currently as Hector Salamanca on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Last season, he appeared in both Dress to Kill and Christmas Evil, which by coincidence both feature Fiona Apple's dad, Brandon Maggart. Marianne Mueller Lyle played party goer, uncredited. I didn't see her in here, but it's another uncredited role. She made an uncredited appearance in Hero at Large, Willie and Phil, Stardust Memories, and she'll show up again in next week's Endless Love. She doesn't have many huge credits, but I recognize her IMDb profile picture from her turn as Wrong Sarah in The Terminator. She's also the tattoo artist in Memento, but she's the woman who, when Arnold is working his way through the phone book, he goes to the first Sarah Connor. He goes to the first Sarah Connor's house and he pushes open the door and shoots her immediately. <laughs> Sorry. I did it in his voice. You did. Sarah Connor. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you guys to bring your favorite butlers to the record so that we could discuss some of uh, our favorite butlers on film. Jess, I think I, I have a suggestion for you if you're looking. Um, uh, I ha I, I, I'm getting there. I have two. On the, off the top of my head because I didn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either, so I'm doing it right now very quickly in my head. I worked so hard on my list. <laughs> Sorry, I've I've been working on other episodes simultaneously, so. Richard, why don't we start with you? All right. Uh, I guess I'm going to start with, uh, these are in no particular order. Sure. So I'm going to start with Alfred. Of course. Not from Batman. Oh. oh. Uh, yeah. I'm going to do Alfred... From uh, Batman Returns. <laughs> <laughs> no. Batman and Robin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Uh, Alfred from Hudson Hawk. Okay. The, the butler with the folding blades in his cufflinks. Yeah. All right. Uh, who is the uh, butler to the, uh, uh, the, the Mayflower, played by Sandra Bernhardt and Richard E. Grant, who also go up as my favorite terribly rich like, people rich people on screen couple because they're yeah. just magnificent together <laughs> but the fact that he just has these blades in his sleeves that he just cuts people down with. yeah 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 um i'm gonna go for for my first uh butler with tony randall from fooling around who's the butler to the cloris leachman household all right that's fair if we're if we're gonna go with movies we just watched <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> then i'm gonna go with I guess we'll call him Jeeves, who would be Lady Holiday's butler, who wasn't really her butler, but she oh, okay. called her butler in uh, Great Muppet Caper. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm going to go with the dead butler from the Great Muppet Caper. No, he wasn't, he wasn't dead. He was. He left. 
Okay, uh, Richard, what's your what's your next? Uh, my next one is Max from Cats Don't Dance. Uh, I've never seen that one. Uh, Max is the gigantic wall of a butler to the uh, Shirley Temple parody of Darla Dimple. <laughs> and she just screams for him to come in whenever she needs like a situation. And he's just, he's just massive. He's like the biggest thing on the screen. <laughs> um, and he mostly just responds with, yes, Miss Dimple. Uh, <laughs> I think it's supposed to be a Sunset Boulevard yeah. kind of parody. Well, that reminds me that my next choice is Lurch from the Adams Family movies. That's a good one. I like that one. Well, my next choice is Wadsworth from Clue. All right. That's a good one. And then Richard, who do you have for? Uh, my last one is James Sir Benson Mum, played by Alec Guinness. Yeah. <laughs> in Murder <laughs> by Death. The that's blind good, one. That's a really good one. Yeah, the blind butler who has an amazing set of reveals at the very end of the movie. <laughs> He's a Jedi, it turns out. My next one is Roddy McDowell from Charlie Chan and the Curse what? of the Dragon. What? No, don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't. No, no, I'm not, not going to do that. Um, hmm. What other butlers have we covered? <laughs> it doesn't have to be one we covered. It doesn't have to be one that we covered. <laughs> My next one is Charles Gray from The Mirror Cracked. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Shit. I'm going to go with... Uh, Riff Raff from Rocky Horror. I'm going to go with Street Rat from <laughs> <laughs> Aladdin. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. <laughs> what are you talking about? Riff Raff. Street Rat. I don't, I don't buy, buy that. that. If only Alfred Pennyworth. <laughs> yeah, no one's done Alfred Pennyworth, so. Alfred Pennyworth. There you go. But Specifically which, the Michael Goff. That was going to be my question. Yeah. You know? Because... Uh, He's marvelous as that character. And I really haven't liked how they've changed it for anybody else. I mean, who is doing it now? It's uh, Jeremy Irons. Jeremy Irons is well, currently. Is he doing The Batman? Who is he playing Alfred in The Batman? I don't know, actually. That would be weird because he was Ben Affleck's Alfred. Right. Sorry, I'm trying to bring it up. But I mean, Michael Caine was fine, but he just wasn't. Uh... Andy Circus. That's right. An- Andy Circus is. Yeah. Because it's a CG butler in this next one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just Gollum. it's just Gollum in a suit and tie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Batman is my precious. My runner up was Emilio uh, from Mr. Deeds, John Turturro. Oh, okay. Butler, yeah. Who's obsessed with feet. Doesn't he have like black feet from. Uh, no, uh, Adam Sandler has a frostbitten foot. Oh, yeah. Um, but <laughs> very sneaky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and when Eric Avery at the end. Uh, Please for his job. He's like, all right, you can have your job, but tomorrow morning I change your socks. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think that's everything for Arthur. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. What's that sound? We got one! That's right. It's another new patron, Chris Baker. As a $5 patron of the show, Chris now has access to 26 full-size 70s reviews and 31 mini-sodes from 1980 and a hand in choosing next month's film. For April of 1972, $5 patrons are choosing between the following four titles. Only four. I couldn't. It was very hard this month to find titles that people would care about. But I settled with these four. Fritz the Cat, Ralph Bakshi's feature film debut, an adult animated black comedy adapted from the comics of R. Crumb about American college years of the 1970s, seen through the eyes of an anthropomorphized cat named Fritz. Buck and the Preacher, a Sidney Poitier western starring himself, Harry Belafonte, Ruby Dee, and Cameron Mitchell, and following a man leading wagons west, but constantly hounded by white plantation owners trying to run them off their new land. Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, A Roy Ward Baker Hammer film and a twist on Robert Louis Stevenson's story wherein Dr. Jekyll slash Jack the Ripper, as played by Ralph Bates, is transformed by experimentation into Mrs. Edwina Hyde, played by Martine Beswick. And Lone Wolf and Cub, Baby Cart at the River Styx, 
the second installment of Kenji Misumi's Lone Wolf and Cub series, which we have already kind of reviewed in the form of its 1980 mashup with Episode 1, Lone Wolf and Cub's Sword of Vengeance, into the American release Shogun Assassin, each of which will be celebrating their 50th anniversaries this April. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Endless Love, which IMDb describes like so. David and Jade are high school sweethearts and happy in love, but when Jade's grades start to drop, her father forbids the young couple to see each other. Mad with frustration and desire, David tries to reverse the decision with catastrophic results. Yeah.